but I confess you will cover. And what I let go of, you will control. Mm. Mm. So, Father, we confess what we can't control. Because we can't control it, don't mean we can't speak to it. So, Father, we speak to every mountain that it be moved and cast into the sea. And I take my hands off of trying to make it happen. And I let you control it, God. So, Father, I don't know what it is that the people in this room need to start opening their mouth confessing. Maybe it's the dream. Maybe it's a promise. Maybe it's something that you've spoken that we feel like maybe it's not going to happen. God, we start confessing it again in Jesus' name. We start giving your word back to you. We start telling our, promise, our problem about our promise now. And God, we'll take our hands off of it and we'll let you bring it to pass. And I thank you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sister Erica. Give God a hand. Praise for her one more time. Amen. Powerful, Sister. Powerful. Here's the word of the Lord in Luke chapter 10. If you've got Luke chapter 10, shout, I got it. If you need a second, say, hold on a second. Luke chapter 10, verse 25, we are continuing our series called The Problem with Love. And this is an interesting story to talk about love from because it really is the story of the Good Samaritan. But I don't want to read the story. I just want to read the conversation leading up to the story of the Good Samaritan. And it starts in verse 25. It simply says, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? In other words, how do you understand it? You know, what does your law say? And so he answered, That you shall love the Lord God, your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as himself. And he said to him, you have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. And the word of the Lord is blessed. Now, for you Bible purists, the lawyer continues to talk in verse 29 and asks questions like, okay, um, so who is my neighbor? But he does that. Watch this. He does that. After Jesus tells him what's necessary. So he says, tell me how to inherit the kingdom of heaven. Jesus says, well, how do you figure you should inherit the kingdom of heaven? What does the word of God say? He says, well, that I love the Lord, my God, my heart, my mind, my soul, and with all my strength. And I love my neighbor as I love myself. Jesus replied back to him, oh, okay, you, you did it right. No further discussion needed. And then, of course, he begins to discuss it anyway. I could probably preach right there about how many times we keep talking when Jesus stops. How many times we talk ourselves out of what Jesus has settled in our lives. Am I talking to anybody in here? All right, but we're going to end the conversation where Jesus ended it. He said, you do this, you answered rightly, do this and you'll be fine, you'll live. I want you to look over at your neighbor and say, love and worship. The love and worship. The problem with love, love and worship. You cannot worship what you don't love and you will worship what you do love if you don't balance it all right so so I want you to tell your neighbor real quick we're going to talk to each other for about 30 more seconds I want you to tell your neighbor real quick say today is not about you today is about me and God today is about me and God tell, tell your other neighbor say today is not about you point down the aisle if you got to tell them today is about me and God today is about me and God Today is about me and my worship. It's not about us and our praise. It's not about touching and agreeing. It's not about getting mine and you get yours. It's not about shouting. It's not about today is about me and me and God. Me and God. Me and God. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for the anointing. I thank you for the word of God. I thank you above all things that you are God. Period. And everything that you have settled. Don't let us pick it up again to discuss it and conversate about what you finished. Uh, yeah. 
I give you praise now. I pray for an anointing that will sweep this house and make worship be radical and like it's never been before in the life of someone in this room. I pray that by your spirit you will arrest folly and, uh, and, and distraction. I pray that you would send the anointing that makes the devil get on his heels and back out of the life of the men and women that find place in you. And I give you praise for it now in Jesus' name. Now, if you would anoint this preacher to preach the word of God and let him be an oracle, we'd be so kind. And if you would allow us to be vessels to hear the word of the Lord, we'd give you the praise and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can be seated in God's presence. Smile at somebody. Say, it's just church. Just church. It's just church. It's just church. It's just church. The problem with love, uh, today we talk about love and worship. It's this reality and the truth that what you worship, you will love, and that anything that you love, you have the potential to worship it. And there's a, a reality of trying to create the balance here that operates within God because on one hand, it is not wrong for you to give something um, it's proper play, to give something place in your life, but it is wrong when you give it an inordinate space in your life. Everything that is connected to God uh, has to be prioritized just underneath God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And this is important. So today we do want to talk about God and we want to talk about love and we want to speak about worship and we want to speak about them in the context of how we, if we relate to God. But before we go into the scripture and talk about this issue and this conundrum um, and this problem with love, uh, it, it's important that we understand a few things about God first. And here's the first thing I want you to, to, to take down if you're a net note taker as it relates to God. God is holy and God is a jealous for his honor. God is holy and God is jealous for his honor. You should put that down in your note somewhere. God is holy. Somebody shout, God is holy and he is jealous for his honor. All right. Now, let's understand this. While you're writing, this is critical because this is not something that Terrell wrote. This is not something that Terrell asked. The thing about God that sometimes we miss when we learn anything about God, we have a tendency to give it credit, to give credit where credit is not necessarily due. Most of us think that we have learned about God because we have studied the scripture. And that is not how you learn about God. Studying the scripture is proper. It is what God has asked for, from us. But it is not the way that we know that God is and that we learn about God. The scripture is, is simply a tool that reinforces something else. We don't learn about God from our experiences per se. Our experiences are not necessarily and do not necessarily tell us or teach us anything about God. Pastor, you're making no sense because you challenge us to read the Bible and you tell us that we learn about God in our uh, experiences. Make this make some sense. Well, if you give me a few seconds, I would. The thing about God is that God is not visible. The Bible says that he exists. It teaches us that he exists in an unseen dimension, an unseen world. An unseen dimension and an unseen world which you and I have no access to. The only reason we know that there is an unseen world is because he told us there was an unseen world. This reality that God is unseen means that in order for us to know who God is, in order for us to know that God is, God has to come out of the dimension of where he's not seen and in some capacity be visible to us that he is. This is not your merit. This is his merit. So now there has to be what we call revelation. Somebody shout revelation or illumination, shout illumination. A revelation is the uncovering or the revealing of himself. The illumination is the light switch goes on in us. In other words, those two things have to happen. When God is ready to be known, he first uncovers himself. And then he has to push on your heart for you to see or be illuminated that that's him standing in front of you. Because he's in an invisible space and he never has to come out of that invisible space. And if you were reaching for God and he never revealed or illuminated, you wouldn't know where to go to find him. You wouldn't have a book that you could find him in. You wouldn't even know that you were looking for him. You wouldn't be able to look at the stars and say, where is God? There is no way that you could touch him, find him, get to him unless he first reveals himself to you and then illuminates himself in your heart. 
Peter asked, Jesus asked the question, who do men say that I am? Peter said it like it wasn't a big thing. He said, you know, they said you're John the Baptist, and so they say you're other people. And then Jesus said, but who do you say that I am, Peter? And Peter replied back like it wasn't a big deal. You're the Christ. You're the one that reigns supreme. And that's the way many of us operate when it comes to God. How do you know God? I've been saved since I was 15. I've been walking with the Lord. He's been good to me. He's God, and I know he's God. But you got to look at what Jesus said next. He said, that ain't how you know, just because you know. Flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you, but my Father that is in heaven revealed himself to you. You would not know how to know to call me to Christ unless God moved on you first and said, hey, I'm here, and then put it on your heart to make you say, you are here. And this is revelation and illumination, which means that when God says that he is holy and he is jealous of his honor, I didn't say it. The only way that the writer in the book could write it was if God told him what to write. So everything that we know about God is not because Moses said it, but because God told Moses. In other words, the only way we know to call him righteous is because God in heaven said, I reveal myself and I'm righteous. So Moses just echoed what God said about himself. So God's holiness, watch this, is not Moses' estimation of God. This is God's estimation of God. So now anything that you know about God, God is the one that told you. Any illumination you have about God, you had a divine experience with God. And even though the church world has made it so normal for us to come into spiritual things, Paul tried to tell us that no man can say, Lord, Lord, unless the spirit of God reveals it to him that he is Lord. It is a miracle and a move of God that you're in this place worshiping and praising God the way you are. And you should know. Never take for granted that you have the no that God is for you to worship him. And that no is not something that everybody has. Are you hearing what I'm saying? God says, so watch this now. So God says, and I want you to keep this in mind. This is what God says about himself. He says, I'm holy. Somebody shout holy. That means I'm untainted. I'm unspotted. I am the bar. I am right. I am the litmus test. I am without taint. If something is blue and you call it red, if God called it blue, whatever you thought was red, just turn blue because God can't be wrong. He is the truth. This is what it means to be holy. It means to be without error, without spot. It means to be without taint. It means to be without sin. It goes well beyond just right and wrong. It means that he's always right and has never been wrong and he has given himself the position and the title as holy and he says that when I reveal yours myself to you I want you first and foremost to accept me as being holy so whatever you thought was wrong whatever you were thinking readjust it whatever you were experiencing you got to think about it again because I'm holy and watch what he says now and that I don't like to share my honor with anybody this is the way we learned this from God. We're not the ones that came up with God as a jealous God. God said to the children, I am your Lord, your God. I am a jealous God. Jealous literally means to be, to feel some kind of way about something that somebody else possesses. So watch what God is saying when he talks about worship. What he's saying is worship, which is built off of the word worth, and worship literally could be told as the word worth-ship because anything that you worship, you have, you have given value or worth to. So when God is talking to us about worship, he is literally trying to help us understand that I am a jealous God and I don't want you giving worth to anything else in this world except for me because I am the only one that should have worship. Why? Because I'm holy, which means that I am the litmus test for everything that has value. And I'm going to feel some kind of way if you share my value with somebody else. This is God. He's got, a, he's got a problem when you share value, when you share worship. Now, what does that mean, that worship? How does that, how is that, that, that moving with God? Because with God, he's all or nothing. There is no such thing as I gave God 90 and I only share a little bit with, some, with the rest of the world, but God gets my most. God gets the most. God don't play that I get the most. God wants it all. 
Are you hearing what I'm saying? He says, I want you to present your body to me, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable service. He said, I want your body. Then he said, and renew your mind. He said, renew your mind. In other words, he said, I want your body. I want your mind. I want your feelings. I want your emotions. I want everything to work itself around me and see that I am the litmus test for all that is right, holy, and good. And until you see that your value is not as valuable as as my presentation, you will never be able to give me what I deserve. Somebody shout, he's valuable. Somebody shout, he's valuable. Come on, say it loud, shout, he's valuable. Now, the thing about value is not in the item itself. Value is always not necessarily in the, in the, in the, value, in the thing that is, has worth. It is in the ascriber of worth, which means that the thing that is to be worshipped is never the problem. It's always the worshiper that's the problem. So if there's something that doesn't get its proper value, it's got nothing to do with whether or not the item itself has worth. It has everything to do with what you choose to ascribe to it. God help me in this place. A Bugatti is worth $300,000 no matter what you think about it. You might walk up on it and say, I never paid $300,000 for a car. Well, that don't mean they're going to change the price because you don't see the value in it. Uh, am I preaching to anybody in here? But this is the way the church approaches God, is that because I, I don't see him in all of his grandeur and in his splendor, because I accept him based on my experience and not based on his word about himself, I put my value on him based on whether he's blessing me or healing me or touching me or doing great things for me, instead of just seeing that he's God all by himself, whether he blesses me or doesn't bless me, God is saying that you've got to learn how to value me before I do anything for you because worship is not in the worship, it is in the worshiper. Where is your estimation of God? Is he valuable or does he have to bring himself down to your level before you give him what he deserves? And I'm going to help you with something, that if you ever devalue God to the level in which you can understand God, then you have already lowered his value in your estimation. Because God says that my thoughts are higher than your thoughts, my ways are higher than your ways. When you think you've given me value, you haven't given me enough value. And if you think you've given me enough value, you have devalued me and you can't call it worship. Somebody shout worship. This is what God wants you to know about him. I want to give you another thing real quick that God wants you to know about him. I want you to see that God has forbidden us to worship anything besides him. This is what he says. I'm telling you, this is God talking to us. God says that I'm holy and I don't like to share my honor. That's one. God said it. The second thing God says is that I don't want you to worship anything but me. I'm feeling some kind of way that you worship your car more than you worship me. I'm feeling some kind of way that you worship your marriage more than you worship me. I'm feeling some kind of way that you prioritize religion over relationship. I feel some kind of way that this is the way that you have chosen to do your life. And I know you don't want to admit it, so just keep looking at me because I know the person next to you is who I'm really talking to, not you. But most of us have reprioritized life and put life above God. When life starts to happen, we start to focus on problem instead of focusing on God. When life starts to happen, we focus on issue instead of focus on God. And what happens is we are constantly removing God and putting him lower and lower on the rim. And when, God, when your hope is low on the rung, there is nothing but hopelessness. That's why we've got to raise God back to the top so that we can always see hope even above our problems. The third thing that God, I want you to know about God, very simply and very quickly, the third thing I want you to know about God is that as it relates to worship, God doesn't want anybody else to worship, you to worship anything else, not just any other God. That's a given. My God don't want you worshiping your children. Amen. I know, not my children. Yeah, your child, the one that ain't never wrong. I know your child, the one, the one that the teacher caught red-handed, but you're going to make an excuse. The child that you don't hold to any accountability and won't let anybody else hold him to accountability. That child. That child. Watch this. God, God is not into marriage being worshipped. Amen. 
Marriage is a good thing. The Bible said it's honorable before God, but it's not to be worshipped. And here's where the 21st century Neo-Pentecostal church has to be careful, is that we have put an image of marriages out there instead of putting the image of Christ out there. And what is happening now is unless somebody is married, they, can't, they don't got a word for you. Unless they got a dope marriage, they don't have a word for you. And that is not going to be the way that God operates. God is not into the imagery and the marketing of marriage and not the marketing of him, him being Jesus Christ and him crucified. And even though we look like power couples, the reality of it is, is can't nobody's great marriage save your soul, heal your body, bring you back into account. And God is not okay with the church marketing the ministry of marriage over marketing the ministry of reconciliation through Christ Jesus. Somebody ought to shout amen. All right, all right, all right, all right. I'm just trying to help the church get to heaven. I'm trying to help the church love Jesus. Because you know what I realized? I realized that heaven is about being in the presence of Jesus. And if you don't love Jesus, you ain't going to like heaven. If we don't fall in love with the reality of the way that God presents himself, and he's worthy to be loved, and he's worthy to be honored, and he's worthy on his own merits. He's worthy all by himself. And that's part of what worship is, is that even when life ain't going right, he's still worthy to be worshipped. Even when things are not good, he's still worthy to be worshipped. Even when the marriage is tight, he's still worthy to be worshipped. Even when the money's not strong, he's still worthy to be worshipped. And at some point, we've got to get to the point that there is God and then there's everything else. He said, I am God and there is no other. I am there, I'm God, there is no other. So he, uh, I want you to write this down as the third thing and the third idea is that when it comes to worship, because God is the one that tells us who he is and we have to accept it. Because God is the one that reveals himself as holy and as jealous of honor, we've, we have to move ourselves around the reality of how to make him feel prioritized. The third thing you got to understand is that God is also a God that patterns worship. There is a divine pattern as it relates to worship. You cannot give God whatever you want and call it worship. I'm going to preach that till Jesus come back. You cannot give God whatever you want and call it worship. You, just because it was your best don't mean it was worship. Just because it was what you had doesn't mean he calls it worship. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Just because it was a whole lot doesn't necessarily mean he calls it worship. There is a divine pattern by which God calls worship. Somebody that loves you and beats on you, if you accept that as love, shame on you and shame on them. But here's the reality. When you know who you are, then you realize that you pushing on me, punching on me, spitting on me, talking crazy to me is not the way I will accept love. And that is not love and you're not going to push on me, punch on me, spit on me, talk crazy to me, and make me believe that it's love. And you cannot bring that kind of love to me and say it's love just because you use the word love and there is no action behind love. Stay with me now because Jesus is the exact same way. He gets to dictate what worship looks like to him. The same way you get to teach the world how to love you, God gets to teach the world how to worship him. And no, you don't get to bring him anything from the world and throw Jesus' name on it and put it at the altar and say good now I can use this as worship God saying that that's not the way that I receive worship you've got to give me worship the way I have demanded worship or else it's not worship the children of Israel now in the desert, they leave, they leave, and this is important. The children of Israel, Moses goes to Pharaoh and tells Pharaoh to let God's people go. Why? He said God wants them to go into the desert that they may worship him. He didn't send them to the desert to wander. He didn't send them to the desert to have church. He didn't send them to the desert to, to create uh, 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 small groups and sections among themselves. God sent them to the desert to worship because God knew that the way my people would be identified in the earth was not by crosses and yarmulkes and crescent uh, moons. They would be known in the earth by the way they worship, that their worship would be different than everybody's worship. So God calls Moses up to the top of the mountain, tells Moses, I'm going to give you the Ten Commandments. Watch this. While they're on the ground waiting on Moses to come back, they get impatient and they start building a golden calf. Now here Here's the thing that we miss when we talk about this story. They didn't build a golden calf to worship a false god. 
They built a golden calf to worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They just wanted to have an image that represented him in the earth. And the pagans, now you got to understand why God was so mad. Because the pagans created golden images and they called that worship as they prayed to their God. They are going to take the golden image and leave the gods out there, bring it into the church and give it to this God and expect God to call it worship. Moses comes down off the mountain with, ten, with the Ten Commandments, sees what they've done, throws the commandments on the ground, and they complain back to him saying, what? What do you mean? We're just, this is not, we're not worshiping their gods. We just brought the image into our church. So now our worship service looks like theirs, even though we threw Jesus' name on it. Y'all are not talking back to me in here. You don't get to give God what you want him to have and call it worship. It might be your best. It might be your experience. It might be the way you grew up. But you don't get to bring what's in the world into the house of the Lord and tell God, this is what I'm giving you, except it is worship. God says you got to take that and your trifling self out of the house of God. Watch this. Renew your mind first. Forget all of this stuff out here and when you come into the house of the Lord now you can worship me with a pure heart that's not tainted by worldly practices oh no you don't get to bring that no 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 touch your neighbor so you don't get to bring that you don't get to bring that no 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 you don't get to bring that you don't get to bring that you don't get to throw up crypt sign, Jesus signs, you know, blood sign, Jesus sign. You don't get to do that kind of stuff. But this is my culture, but it's not the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God has a new culture. He said, I called you out of darkness and brought you into the marvelous light. And even though it might be your best, it's still missing what God has called as worship. And you're giving it to him. But he's looking at it and saying, you can't call my name with a calf in front of you. Can't call on my name with a calf in front of you. He said, there's something wrong with it. The Bible called, uh, it, when the temple started, they called that strange fire. And there's too much strange fire going up in the church. There's too much fire where God is saying, what, what is, what they burning in there? That don't smell like you put something, you put something in that worship song. That smell Cardi-ish. You put something. God, y'all, I'm, trying, I'm trying, to, trying to help you understand. I'm trying to, y'all think that's cute. God don't. That's what your Bible say. I'm trying to tell you what the Bible say. God doesn't, but God, we think that's dope. Oh, we're trying to mix the culture. And God said, that's the problem. You can't mix the culture. He said, we can't mix the culture. He said, when you go into this land, he said, I don't want you mixing the culture. Joseph, I, I'm, I'm Moses, I got a problem because the who you went to go pick as a wife, you mixed the culture. He said, he said, he told Samson, I got a problem because who you pick, you picked and you mixed the culture. And when you mix the culture, it gives God a strange fire. And it makes people think they're closer to God than they really are. Because it makes us feel good. But then make God feel all that good. I mean, can you imagine your wife showing up? And what do you do with her ex-boyfriend's favorite perfume on? Why you wear that? Cuz. Mike, he used to like it. I got a response from him when he when I and you like, well. <laughs> I need the Holy Ghost right now, you know. I was like, I was like, yeah. Almost one of the things almost came out real quick. So, see, you see, bringing God worship, and God say, "Boy, that smell like that smell like the world." What you give me smell like smell like a different time and a different space and a different. So I want to give you four things real quick about worship and love and love and worship with God. I want to give you four things real quick to bless your soul and to challenge your, your to challenge you as it relates to love and worship. I want to give you these four things about the pattern. Somebody shout the pattern. 
I want to give you four ideas that are part of the pattern of the, the order in which God requires worship. Here's the first thing. The first thing is this, is that there cannot be any, the first part of the pattern as it relates to worshiping God is directly centered around repentance and confession of sin. Repentance and confession of sin. Repentance and confession of sin. There cannot be worship without repentance and confession of sin. And this is where you have to understand how God views worship as opposed to how God views praise. Praise is very different when it comes to God. Praise is something that God has regulated for everything that he's created. Scripture teaches us that the stars, the sun, the moon, they all keep their course in praise to God. The scripture teaches us that the sinner and the, and the unrepentant, they can open their mouth and praise God. Praise is a response to the goodness of God. And sometimes we know that God has done something good for us and we give a response. It is called praise. This is why the Bible teaches us that anything can praise God. Everything can praise God. All you have to do is be able to recognize that it wasn't you. Something else did it. And you can give a response and God will call that praise. He says, let everything that has breath praise ye the Lord. You can praise God. Your neighbor can praise God. Your unsaved cousin in them can praise God. Your, 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 the, the, the drug dealer can praise God. The wino can praise God. The whoremonger can praise God. Everybody can open up their mouth and praise God. The flowers in your backyard, if they're growing, they're doing what God told them to do. God calls that a praise. Everything in this world can praise God. If God created it and it responds to what God created it for, it is considered a praise to God. Now, the thing that God tells you and I about praise is that I will inhabit the praises of my people. And praising God is what, what God has given as a special treat to the people that love him that is different from the people that do not love him. Is not that they can't praise, but I will come and live in the praises of my people, the ones that do love me. I come and I settle in their praise. That's why when you come to the house of the Lord, you can't let anybody take your praise. You don't leave your praise in your problem that happened Friday. You can't leave your praise in the bad news you got Thursday. You've got to pick your praise up and bring it into the house of the Lord because God says that where my people are praising, I'm going to be in the midst of them. That is why I can't let the rocks cry out in praise because he's not going to put his presence on the rocks. But if the people of God open their mouth in praise, his presence will come upon his people. Where are my praisers at? When his presence comes, his power comes. When his presence comes, his wisdom comes. Everything that has breath should open up his mouth and give God the best praise that you can. I know it's 919. I know it's 1119 in the morning, but I want you to open up your mouth and let everything in this building that has breath praise ye the Lord. Praise him on the instruments. Praise him with the timbrels and harps. Praise him with the dance. Praise him with an uplifted voice. Praise him with the clapping of hands. Praise him with the dance. Praise him. Let everything that has breath where are my praisers at in this house? Praise him because he's been good. Praise him because he's been healing. Praise him because he's been bringing it back together. Praise him because he helped you while you were grieving. Praise him. Let everything, somebody shout everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Anything, anything could dare shout and have praise. Oh, God, and every now and then you ought to just praise him just because. You ought to worship him just because. Praise don't need an organ. Y'all not help me. Praise just needs to think about a problem and what God did for that problem. That's all praise needs. Praise needs to think about a situation and how God showed up in that situation. Praise just needs to think about how you were stuck and how God helped you get unstuck. And there's a response to the way that God deals with me that makes me want to praise. And the deeper my problem, the greater my praise. In anything, somebody shout everything can praise God. Tell your neighbor, say everything can praise God. Tell your neighbor, say so you ought to praise God. Everything can praise God. Everything can lift up voice. Everything can say thank you. Everything can say I appreciate it. Everything can say I honor you. Everything can say good looking out. Everything can say everything that has breath can praise the Lord. However, however, worship is for an exclusive. 
explosive group of people. Everything can't worship. Because it's only for an exclusive group of people. It's for those that have repented and confessed of their sins. Why? Because of where you got to go in order to worship. The Bible says that when God, when we praise God, God inhabits the praises of his people. Inhabit means to live. That means that he comes out of heaven and he moves his way through the crowd. And he comes down here on earth and his presence rests on earth. That's God coming to us. But the Bible says when the woman at the well asks God about worship, God says you worship what you know not. In other words, you don't even really know how to worship because the time has come and the time is that those that worship me have to worship me in spirit. In other words, they got to come to where I am. You don't get to stay in your flesh and worship because flesh can't get in the spirit. I wish I was preaching to somebody in here. You don't get to have a bad attitude and worship because worship is a thing of a bad attitude is a thing of the flesh. If you're going to get in the spirit, who can ascend to the hill of the high God? But Psalm 24, he that has clean hands and a pure heart, that's how you get in the spirit. And if you don't come by the blood of the lamb, you cannot get in the spirit to worship. Where are my worshipers at? Where are my blood-washed believers at? Where are my folks that know that they've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb? You are a candidate for worship. Slow music don't mean you worshiped. I'm going to say that one more time because you didn't dim the lights and got you a little prayer in. That don't mean you worship. Have you been washed by the blood of the Lamb? Have you been baptized in the waters? Have you, y'all ain't talking back to me. Then you're qualified for worship. Qualified for worship because, because I believe. Now, watch this. There's certain people that can't bring me a gift. There are certain people that don't, don't bring me a gift. But I'm not a bad person. But you're not qualified to bring me that level of a gift. Yes, I, I wish I was talking to somebody in here. You, you, hey, brothers, you don't get to bring my wife flowers. It's an amazing gesture. It's a wonderful gesture. And you might not mean nothing by it, but it is, a, it is a gift that is out of the realm of what you should offer to her because you are not in that kind of relationship. Uh, Y'all need to help me preach this thing. Y'all need to help me preach this thing. See, everybody is not qualified to bring God worship because they're not in that kind of relationship with him. Worship is regulated for the one that's in that kind of relationship. God said, everybody can't bring me the gift of worship. Only people that's in that kind of relationship with me, that blood washed relationship with me, they can bring me worship. Everything can praise but only, only people that are in this kind of relationship watch, can, bring, can bring me a gift. And I want you to see this about worship, the difference between praise and worship. In praise, God leaves and comes to us. In worship, God gets to stay at rest. He sits on his throne, and you got to do the work to get to him. God, help me in this place. You got to do the work to get to him. It's like, God, I got, that means I got to take my bad week off to get to you. And I got to take, watch this, see, huh, God help me in this place. See, worship, pr- praise will help you get a bad week off. Worship, you can't do till the bad week is off you. Uh, worship will help you get the, praise will help you get the attitude off you. But worship, you can't do till you got your attitude straight. Because, because you can't bring something on a tank that is tainted into the presence of God and not, ex- and not expect him to, to have a problem with it because his presence is still holy. Worship says, worship says you just stay where you are. Worship says you just lay back where you are. Worship does like Mary does. She says you just, you just, you like the woman does rather that broke the alabaster box. She goes and she's a, a woman of medium means and she gets the real expensive gift that she got. She come out with her, with her Tom Ford jewelry. He's, you know, mid, 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 middle class life but got a, Got a couple of trinkets that, that, that give her a promise of the next level. And Jesus is sitting on the, on the floor, and she comes over to him with this expensive 
oil of perfume, jar of perfume. And she looks at the worth of it and the worth of him. She looks at the value of it and the value of him. And it's not even a question because both of them are going to be broken. Uh, Jesus, help me in this place. Uh, in a couple of years, y'all better stay with me, Bible readers. In about a day, in a couple of hours, both of them are going to get broken. Jesus, help me here. But Except one is going to get broken by enemies. One is going to get broken that don't know who he is. One is going to get broken by one that hates him. This is why the Bible teaches that if we don't understand him, we crucify him just like they did. One is going to be broken, but I'm not going to break. I'm going to praise. I'm not going to break. I'm going to worship, and I'm going to break what is expensive to me to give you your value here on earth. And she breaks her jar of alabaster box. And while it's sleeping on the floor, she starts to sop it off the ground. And she puts it on his feet and begins to massage it on his ankles and his legs. And they, and they came and they was like, but the box was so expensive. We could have used that money for something else. She said, you don't understand. You don't understand. You don't understand what he's about to do tomorrow. You, you don't understand how he's about to radically change our lives. See, you're still looking at Jesus, Joseph's boy, and you're not seeing Savior of the universe. And if you did, then you wouldn't just praise him for doing good stuff out there, for feeding the 5,000. You would worship him because he's in our presence right now. She said, this, she said, she said this, this little tailor-made jacket ain't going to steal my worship. Uh, me being comfortable and tired at home is not going to steal my opportunity to come worship because, uh, because I know the cost and I value being in worship more than I value being on my couch ain't talking back to me. I value worship more than I value sweating through this jacket. I value worship more than I value not wanting to put miles on my car. I value worship more than I value and God and when I look at what it costs it's not a comparison who's more valuable. He said, but I can't get there without confession of sin. He, she got to lay there. He accepted the gift. Number two, I want you to write this down. Write this down. The order of worship. First, there has to be confession of sin. The second, there has to be restoring God to his preeminent position. I told you earlier that he told, he pulled them out of, he pulled them out of uh, the children out, out of Israel, uh, pulled them out of Egypt rather. He said, I want you to send them to the desert that they might worship me. They go to the desert so that they can worship and they realize that they, they disobey God and after 40 years of them wandering through the wilderness, God pulls Joshua to the side and tells Joshua, Joshua, it's your turn now. He says, Joshua, I want you, to, you and Moses to go over and I want you to have a dual conversation. And when you have this dual conversation, while you're talking, while Moses is talking, he's going to reread the law to them. And then while you're talking, I'm going to take Moses up to the top of the mountain and I'm going to take him away. And when I take Moses away, you're going to be in control of all of the children of Israel and you're going to cross the Jordan and go to the land that I promised you. You're not going to wander around in the desert anymore. You're going to go to the place that I promised you. He said, however, he said, I want you to tell them this first and foremost. I want you to remind them that I'm the one that pulled them out of Egypt. And I am their God, and that is it. And I don't want any questions about who I am. He said, I am the Lord, your God, that pulled you out of Egypt. I am your God, and there shall be no other gods before me. He tells him that before I bless you, you're going to know who I am. He said, before I give you this next miracle in your life, you're going to have to put me back where I belong. He said, you don't have to wander in this desert, but you're not going over to the promise no more until somebody can put me back where I belong in their life. When the church gets ready to really get blessed, it is going to be a church that cries out to God and puts him back at the top. I want to talk to somebody in this room this morning that you are right at the brink of your next blessing. But you will not cross the Jordan until you make it clear in your heart and your mind that I have a God and there will be no one beside him. When I get the house, I won't lose my worship. When I get the man, I won't lose my worship. When I get the relationships, I won't lose the people I'm talking to in this place. Open up your mouth and give God a worship. Tell your neighbor, it ain't going to be me. It's not going to be me. I'm not going to get blessed 
and then not show up to church. I'm not going to get blessed and then I worship. I'm not going to get a get a blessing and then I give God my best. The devil is a liar. Number three, number three, number three. Somebody shout number three. Trying to get y'all out of here, number three. But we got to restore God to his preeminent position. God is not going to play second to anybody. God's not going to play second to your pastor. He's not going to play second to your prayer team. He's not going to play second to your, your, your prophet. He's not going to play second to all these people playing church. He's not going to play second because you think that you know more than he knows. God will not be mocked. He is God and he is God all by himself and his honor. He will share with nobody else and you don't get to come to church and give more props to your favorite preachers and not give it to the God that anointed them to preach hmm. that's a word to all you gifted folks that's a word to all you gifted folks that think can't nobody get healed unless you lay hands on them that's a note to all you gifted folks that think that can't nobody get a prayer through till they call your prayer line. The devil is a lie. The veil has been rent. I've got access before God. I can come boldly before the throne to the throne of grace and obtain mercy when I need it. I know who to go to. Tell your neighbor I know who to go to. And I'm learning more and more that it ain't people. Because some of the problems that I got are so heavy that people can't handle them. So I share my problems, but I read about it on Facebook. The devil is a lie. You better take them to the Lord in prayer. All right. Number three. Somebody shout number three. We have to restore outward ordinances. Restoring outward ordinances. The Neo-Pentecostal church the first, is very different than the first century church who was unafraid. Hand me that towel, sir who was unafraid of, of, of losing their identity with Christ. We were not afraid in the first century church of, of losing our identity with Christ. Now you've got to watch yourself because this is where our nation has found herself in a very unique space. I'm a history buff and I, have to, and I love the idea of history and, I just, and if you follow history, you'll realize that it does continue to repeat itself in this sense that we make the same decisions generation after generation, people group after people group. And it's a very, very simple pattern that you can watch all throughout the world that began during the Bible day and is happening right now is that there is a... There, there, the, the pattern is that there is always an open, authentic worship. After the open and authentic worship, there becomes an acceptance of things that desensitize our thirst for our God. And it minimizes our worship. When it minimizes our worship, the enemy will sit, sow seeds of other ideas, concepts into the community and into society. Once we accept those ideas into community and society, so community and society changes its course. And when it changes its course, God has to bring some kind of famine to the land to get his people to cry out. What that famine does is it separates the wheat from the shaft. Those that are authentic and that are in will rise up and stand and everything else will wither. And then it goes to another continent. And we have seen that take place from the eastern world all the way around the globe. And we are literally in this space right now. Is that now the body of Christ is afraid to be the body of Christ. We are afraid that somebody's going to say that we're intolerant because we say we love Jesus. They're going to say that you've got to find space for everybody because you say I'm a Jesus walker. Everybody else gets to say who they riding with. Why don't I get to say who I'm riding with? Because when the guy that I ride with takes up a little more space in the car than the guy you riding with, now I can't ride with him. The devil is a liar. God will fill up a room. He will will fill up a conversation. He will fill up the worship set. And if you allow God into the conversation, he will defend himself. And you don't have to fight God's battles. He has been good at fighting them before he made you. Oh, God, help me in this place. So, so, pastor, I don't really understand why we do the Lord's Supper the way that we do the Lord's Supper. Because he told us to. 
He said, if you do, he told us, he said, as often as you remember me, he said, do this. He said, as often as you want to think about me, do this. He tells us that this is going to be an outward ordinance of the way that I, of you loving me in the earth. He goes on to our text. He tells the man in the text, the man said, how can I inherit the kingdom of heaven? And he said, how do you think you should inherit it? He said that I should love God with all my heart, my mind, my soul. He said, love God, love God, which means you got to worship God because you cannot worship God without loving God and you will eventually love what, or worship what you love. He said, so in order for me to love God with my heart, my mind, my body, my soul, in order for me to love my mind, my body, my soul has to come with my love. So now, if we're talking about restoring the ordinance of God, we don't get to be saved and walk with God and not express the expressions of what God has required that we show the world that we're with him, that we love him with all of our heart, our mind, our body, our soul, and our neighbor. Somebody shout, he said that. He said, and our neighbor, the outward ordinance of God. I, I just love him without having to show it. No, you don't get to do that, unfortunately. I, I'm going to love him in my heart without loving him with your hands. You don't get to do that. Number four, somebody shout number four. Number four is the final one, the order of worship. God is trying to tell us how to worship. He has repeated this pattern all throughout Scripture, that there should be repentance and confession of sin, a restoring of God to a preeminent position, and a restoring of outward expressions and ordinances. And then the, third, the fourth thing <clears throat> that had to happen is, you got, is God required that they remove all superstitious, false, and corrupt worship. Everything that's superstitious, everything that's, that's superstitious, he said he got to remove it in order to give me real worship. He said, you can be born again. He said, and you can be, you can put me in the preeminent position. He said, you can even show the world that you love me and express a love for me. He said, but if I still got to come through your kooky superstitions, if the only way you can touch me is that your dress is long enough, if the only way you can touch me is that you got, y'all not talking back to me in here. If the only way you can touch me is that you got on a three-piece suit instead of having jeans preaching in the pulpit. If the only way that you can touch me is having on your nylons. If that's the only way that you can touch me. He said, I don't, I don't work in those kooky superstitions that the church brings to try to control people. Y'all are not talking back to me. Somebody, the, real, the next time somebody say you ought to change this, you ought to say you don't like it, do you? That's the only reason you're asking me to change is because you don't like it. And if you don't like it just say you don't like it don't put God on what you don't like all these kooky crazy superstitions and God says that when I tore the veil you don't have to wear a cross in order to tell people that you're with me you don't have to create a Mary to tell people that you're with me you don't have to put trinkets up you don't have to put these things up in your churches. God's like, it's cool if you do, but you don't have to because I am a God that doesn't have to go through your superstition. You don't have to scream and turn around three times and high five somebody five times and put your right foot in and take your right foot out and put your left. Y'all not talking back to me. You don't have to do these things in order to touch God because there is a God that first came to touch you before you even knew that you wanted to touch him. And that is the God that you ought to lift your worship to and give your praise to. Am I talking to anybody in this place this morning? Give God a shout of praise. I said give him a shout of praise. Stand to your feet all over this building. Child, you're not worshiping. You're not screaming loud enough. You didn't get delivered. You didn't roll under the floor. Your God ain't with you. You're not quirking and shaking. You can only be prayed for by me. And I got to put my right hand, not my left hand. And I got to, da, da, da. and you've got to stand. The devil is a lie. It's superstition. All under this idea of religion. It's superstition. That's not how you meet God. Like you're not blessing, you know, end every prayer in Jesus' name. If you wouldn't baptize and follow the Holy Ghost, you wouldn't do this. Superstition.
And you can't love and control at the same time. And we say we love God, but we want to control how he moves in the earth. The devil is a liar. The church moves and she has revival when she takes her hands off of how to control God. When we take our hands off of how to control God. People come and they say, Pastor, man, you know what I really love? I love to see, you know, the, all the elders and stuff on the stage so we can identify who they are. And we love to see that we follow this format every week. And we love to see. That they, because, why? Because the anointing moves better when I sit on stage. I'm all anointed. <laughs> when I wear my bishop's ring. Is it because you can't shake the perception that God can use an ordinary thing? to get worship out of. Ah, look at your neighbor and say, God can get worship out of me. Tell, come on, keep talking to say, on the stage or in this chair. He can get worship out of me. Pastor, how come we don't? Because I think if Jesus came today, I think he, I think it would turn his stomach to see what we turn church into. I think it would turn his stomach to see what we've turned church into, especially in America. Especially in America. He tur it turned his stomach to see that we become for-profit organizations taking advantage of the laws. It turned his stomach to see that we, that all we, that we actually worship worship. That that's what we worship. We worship worship. We want the lights dim and that, and that is, so we can get into our transit atmospheres. And God is like, hey, you can't worship worship. You got to worship me. And then it's called worship. Are you hearing what I'm saying? In your life, the key to the intimate, unique, personal relationship that God wants to have with you is wrapped up in your worship. Strapped up in your worship. I told you at the beginning to tell your neighbor, this day is about me and God. So this time, don't touch nobody. Just lift your hands high in the air. Father, I'm qualified to bring this gift of worship to you. I put you at the preeminent position in my life. That don't mean I'm perfect, but I know where I'm headed. I'm not ashamed of you. I don't mind the world knowing that I'm holy. I don't mind the world knowing that I'm with you. They can call me a Bible thumper. They can call me a holy world. I don't care what they call me. I, I, I'm not ashamed of being associated with you. I'm unashamed of it. And by God, I will not let religion turn into superstition. I will not let religion turn into superstition. I take this moment to worship you, God. Pastor, how come sometimes people come and kneel at the altar? How come sometimes people come and pray? How come sometimes why you keep throwing us off? Because there can't be, you cannot orchestrate authentic worship. When authentic worship hits, you could be in the cubicle of your, of your job. When authentic worship hits, you could be in a multi-billion dollar meeting. When authentic worship hits, you could be in the dumps feeling like you're going to commit suicide. When authentic worship hits, nothing matters but God. I want you to close your eyes and talk to the Lord. I worship. You can't, you got to stop worshiping your mistakes and worshiping your faults and putting them at a higher position where God called you. You've got to stop worshiping the mistakes of others and the faults of others and putting them in front of what God has called them to be in your life. This is, this is what God is trying to do. He's trying to reestablish himself. And in order to reestablish the church, he has to be at the throne and he has to remind us how worship is. But sir, I'm young and I don't feel the goosebumps. You don't have to feel goosebumps. It's about knowing that God is with you. It's about knowing that God is standing with me. I love you, Jesus. I worship and adore you. Just want to tell you that I love you more than anything.
Come on, lift those hands all over this building. Talk to God. I don't know how you talk to him, but tell him he's wonderful. Tell him he's amazing. Tell him I don't always understand how you move.